I'd already known it, but seeing the empty bottles there killed me. Dad told me he was going to rehab for my brothers and me, to be a good dad, and he'd lied. The hard proof was right before me. Before he'd left for Hazelden, he'd hugged me on the top step of our house. He told me he loved me. And for whatever reason, he'd also said, You're better than this town, Desmond. When you can, leave it. You have a big future ahead of you. I'd hugged my dad and cried with him. I wanted him to get better. And I was relieved that he wanted to, too. I was sad to see my dad in so much pain, even if I had bad memories of him when he was drunk, but I was proud as hell of him for wanting to change. He was my dad, and I loved him. Hello, how are you? Welcome to my channel. My name is Cheer Denise, and today we're doing part two of Tyler Zed's memoir, Trailer Park Parable. Now, if you were with us last time, you know we covered an incredible amount of material in the book, and it was extremely, extremely revealing about everything that had gone on in his life. Um, and it all has encircled around one particular incident that happened to he and his brothers and his mother on December 24th, 2007, when he was 17 years old. And that incident led to his mother being hospitalized and badly, badly beaten. And the person who did that to her was their father. And not only do we find out that it's their father who is the perpetrator who brutally beat their mother, but we found out a lot of things just about his growing up years. And we touched a little bit on what it was like to be in that household with a father who was very irregular in his behavior. Um, and of course, uh, he talks about how when he was young, he thought his dad just drank a lot. And then as he became older, he realized that his father was also addict addicted to opiates um, following a go-kart accident. Um, his dad had built this go-kart that was really unsafe and has been dri had been driving it and then broke a bunch of ribs, punctured a lung, broke his clavicle. And of course, he receives pain, med pain medication for that accident and then was never able to get out from underneath the addictive nature of those pills. But along with that information, we found out a lot of stuff about um, how he ended up in the military, um, what life was like for him in school. Um, he was incredibly popular. He was incredibly good at sports. And so school was really a haven for him. But then as he became older, um, there was just there were just embarrassing moments in which he felt a little bit like the home life that he kept carefully under wraps was being exposed. He had to drive around with these whiskey plates on his car because the car was registered under his father's name. His dad had had multiple DUIs. And so in Minnesota, they have these white plates that start with a W and that indicates that all is not well at your home, you know, if, if, if you've got those. And he was questioned about it at school. And so it was getting to be a little bit embarrassing. But he was still able to hold his own. He just had, like built up defenses against it. Like, I'm just not going to let these jokers like determine how I'm going to feel. But it did bother him. Now, in this section, we're going to talk a lot more about what his home life was like, like and what kind of reign of terror he lived under with his dad. And he and Dee seem to have borne the brunt of it um, much more than their little brother, Bo, seems to have. I'm not sure why that was. But... Um, we are going to talk a lot about how he had to live on eggshells and how he was always prepping for the worst. And there was this constant need to be ready because he didn't know when his dad was just going to, in his words, snap. And his dad snapped a lot. Um, so that's that theme is going to run throughout everything that we read today. Um, one other thing that I need to cover before we get into this, um, I'm sure you guys had assumed or figured out that Tyler Zed is not his real name. His real name is Desmond Janicek. And the reason I'm telling you that now is because he's going to refer to himself continually through this section by his real name. Now, he goes on to talk later when he talks about how the, his YouTube channel was formed and how he came to that pseudonym. But I wanted to make sure that I tell you that now because as we're reading and he continues to re refer to this individual as Desmond, I didn't want you to be like, well, who is that? It's him. 
Okay, let's go ahead and get started. As always, if you will comment, like, and subscribe, I would super, super appreciate it. Thank you so much. To all of uh, Tyler Zed's fans who are here, who are watching the review, let's get started. We are on chapter five. Uh, it starts out um, December 2007. He is heading to the police station. He has to go back and get his cell phone because they had taken his phone so that they could see all the texts his dad was sending him on that night. His dad was sending him some super bizarre text messages and it really put his antenna up. Anyway, the investigators needed to, to read all those and now it was time for him to go back and get his cell phone back. And the investigator had some other questions that he wanted to ask um, to figure out what exactly he had been thinking and feeling that night. He writes, I was heading back to the police station by myself this time because the investigator had my cell phone. They took it that night because they needed to see the text my dad was sending that night. So for a few days, I didn't have any contact with any of my friends or anyone for that matter. But I didn't really care. I didn't want to face anyone. And without having my phone, it made it that much easier to accomplish. Hey, Desmond, how's everything going for you since we last spoke? Come on in. I have your phone just over here. I followed the investigator inside. He grabbed my phone, which was in a little bag. Here you go. We're done with this. Sorry we had to take it from you. You got a few minutes? He asked me. I just want to ask you a couple questions that I didn't get to ask before. Yeah, I don't have anything else going on. We can talk now, I said, and followed him into the same office as before. We sat down at the table and he had his manila folder. Well, before I get to anything else, how are you and your brother holding up? If you guys need anything, you let me know. I know I gave you one of these before, but here's my card again with all my information. Uh, we're good, I guess. I don't really know what to say, to be honest. It, it all just feels like a dream is the best I can say. It's weird. And it did feel like a dream. The situation was surreal. I kept reliving the whole thing over and over and over again. The pictures kept replaying. I thought about mom and how she would be after all of this. How Devin would be. I also may have spoken to my dad for the last time, I thought. I didn't ever want to talk to him again. But that's my dad. My only dad. And now he's gone. And he wasn't dead. But he was gone. Again. It was surreal. And, you know, I think in the previous chapter, he had talked about when his mom's friend Dana was killed suddenly in that car accident right as they were about to leave for a camping trip. And then he also talked about the loss of his hero, his grandpa. And in both of those cases, those people died and were out of his life through no fault of their own. But here his own father is now out of his life. It's like a death, and yet his dad's not dead, but he'll never see him again. But this was a decision his father made. His father made the decision to go in and brutally beat his mother. And I think that the pain of the, I mean, there's, it's just such a layered and complicated pain because his dad didn't have to be out of his life, but he chose to be out of his life. You know, he lost his grandpa, but that was not his grandpa's fault. And now he's lost his dad. And yeah, his dad was a really difficult person to live with. And we're going to we're gonna hear a lot more about that. But it's still his dad, you know? And it just would... I, how, could, how could you sort out how it had come to this? He writes, nobody prepares you for something like this happening. You see these types of things on the news, but you never plan on your family actually being there. I didn't know how to sort out how I felt. So it was hard to answer his question. He opened his manila folder back up. Obviously, depending on how the court process plays out, your dad's going to likely face some time for what he did. It's important that the information and evidence we collect now is whole so that we can best charge him to make the process as smooth and just as possible for everyone. It's innocent until proven guilty for everyone, even though it's pretty obvious what his actions were that other night. Now, the, re now the remaining questions are, why? Where was his head? I'm sure you've been wondering all that yourself. I nodded, sitting there waiting for the questions. That night, with the other investigator, you told him that you knew this was going to happen. That you even told your mom that if you guys went back to the house, he was going to come and possibly hurt someone. How did you know that? What made you believe that he could do such a thing? I sat and I thought for a minute, trying to figure out where to begin. So he flashes back to the night of the incident, December 24th, 2007. He says, we were on our way back from Thief River Falls. We were staying up at my grandma's trailer house for the weekend celebrating Christmas with her and other family members. He says, Christmas Eve, once we got back home from Thief River, we were supposed to go to my dad's apartment, but we were running a little bit late. We'd be about an hour late, and he wasn't happy about it. And if ever there is a dread, it is the dread to go home. Because the person who dreads to go home, there's no comfort for that person. There's nowhere safe to go. And knowing that you have to go and spend some time with your dad, who you are not always comfortable with, who can sometimes act really odd, 
to know you have to go hang out with him and he's angry is would just create such a pit in your stomach. He said, I was sitting in the back seat on the drive home, and by his text, I could tell he was pretty pissed off. Stuff like, your mom's just as screwed up as I am, but I'm the bad guy in all this. He had this idea that mom was trying to keep us from him, which wasn't the case at all. I was 17. Devin was 16. Old enough to see through any sort of manipulation going on. We'd been around long enough and seen these cycles play out enough to know how he operated. Still, as I read his text, I felt the pit in my stomach grow. Just two months earlier, Dad had been finishing up rehab at Hazelden, a world-renowned recovery center, which I was proud of him for doing. But I knew, just by reading his texts, that he was probably drinking or under some sort of influence. I had developed a sort of sixth sense with my dad and his personality shifts. I absolutely hated him when he was drinking. Hated him. I knew what would happen when he drank, and every time he did, I was on edge literally lying in my bed and not sleeping until I knew he had passed out. He'd go through phases of drinking and not drinking. And then after his go-kart accident, he started getting his prescriptions. And he had lived like this without speaking up, noticing the whole time that something was not right with his dad. But he, he watched but didn't say anything until he was about 12 years old. And, you know, when you're 12 years old and you start wanting to assert yourself a little bit more and to start questioning what exactly is going on here, And so he gathered his courage and he asked his dad, um, he said, once when I was about 12, my dad stopped drinking for a few months. And suddenly, one evening started again. And for some reason, that time I had the courage to confront him about it. He was drinking hams. It's weird how I know that detail, but I can see him right now holding the hams can with the empties sitting in the garage stool bench. Dad, are you going to keep drinking much longer? He threw his beer. Your mom told you to ask me that? Mom hadn't said a word to me. She didn't need to. I knew enough on my own to hate his drinking. Thinking mom had been saying things to me, he got mad at her, and the shouting match began. Yeah, there's just no greater uh, enemy to an addict than than their spouse, because the spouse is always going to get it, you know? Um, Never can they take responsibility for their own actions. It's always going to be the fault of the mom. When you have an angry, addicted partner, they will always somehow figure in that the reason they have to be this way is because you, the spouse, can't carry your weight. So of course he's going to twist what Desmond says so that he can now say, did your mom tell you to do this? You know, no, dad, we all see what's going on. Driving back to Brainerd on Christmas Eve in 2007, I felt the exact same pit in my stomach from when I was a kid, knowing he was at his apartment waiting for us, alone, drinking, and pissed off. I mean, there is truly nothing scarier than the unknown, yet really the predictability of an addict who is getting angrier and angrier at you for not doing what they think you should have done. Because it doesn't matter how many times you've experienced that with someone, you know that it never gets easier to deal with it. It never gets easier to not feel scared of that situation. He said, my parents at the time were split up in the middle of finalizing a divorce. They'd been split up since earlier that summer. I didn't really know why they were splitting up. They just said it was happening, and I felt huge relief over it. I found out later that he he wanted the divorce, not my mom. But this wasn't the first time they'd split up. So he said, in 2004, right before Christmas, we'd just gotten home from Thief River Falls after a long weekend, and my parents had been fighting the whole ride home. When we got home, Dad was walking up to the steps, Devin and Bo ahead of him, when he turned to my mom and threw the keys at her. Mom grabbed them, got in the van and said, I'm leaving. I am done being treated like this. I knew the look in my dad's eyes and it scared the hell out of me. I jumped in the van with mom. Dad trapped my brothers inside the house and they were stuck there with him. Before I jumped in the van, and this is so manipulative, I cannot even. His dad says, Des, come on, let's go open presents while your mom walks out on us classic talk of the addict you know it's like your mom's walking out on us like it just entered her pretty little head to just be like you know what i'm done around here i don't feel like i don't feel like being a mom to these three boys you know taking zero responsibility for the fact that you've driven her away come on des come inside we open these presents while your mom leaves us what a monster after that mom and i drove to my dad's sister and her husband's house where mom told them what had happened 
Later that evening, my mom, aunt, and uncle went and got Devin and Bo, and for a week, including Christmas, we were at my aunt's. After that, my parents were split up for about four months. I was just entering high school, a freshman at the time, and I was worrying about my girlfriends, my friends, sports, my future, and then all of a sudden, I had to start trying to figure out where I was supposed to be staying that night, moms or dads, and what kind of arguments I'd be tiptoeing around. Truly a nightmare. Flash forward to when I was 17 and my parents had split up the second time. When my parents announced that they were splitting up, dad rented a two-bedroom apartment about a mile away from where we lived. At the time, I had a 17-year-old social life. I had baseball every day until August when I started football, and I also worked a full-time job in the summer. I was barely at a regular house as it was, and trying to get over to a second house on top of everything was hard. Not to mention, our dad had one extra bed in it, and there were three of us boys. Bo was the only one who split time between our parents regularly. I mean, you know, being the youngest, he would have been easier to control. I mean, his time isn't exactly as eaten up as the older guys. So it makes sense that Bo had to be sort of shuttled between them evenly. After a while, dad started coming over for dinner at our mom's. And it felt weird acting like everything was normal when it wasn't. And I didn't want to sit there anymore pretending that it was. I told mom how I felt about him coming over. And when she relayed the message to dad, he didn't like it. This only added to his ideation that mom was manipulating us to push him away. That Christmas Eve drive home in 2007, I was thinking about all this as dad texted me. We finally got home to mom's from Thief River and we started getting ready for our dads by grabbing his presents and our clothes to spend the next few nights at his apartment. Dad was still texting me once we got inside and the pit in my stomach was a solid rock. Yeah, uh there's nobody as insistent as a control freak with a cell phone and and the idea that you have somehow failed them. They will blow that phone up. And so he goes to his mom. You know, he doesn't want to go. He feels really sure that this is going to be a mistake, both for himself and for his brothers, and that they do not need to get lured into this, that that his dad is acting crazy, his dad is acting weird. It doesn't matter that his dad just got out of rehab two months ago. He knows the signs. So he says to his mom, I don't want to go over there. You have to. You spend time with me, and now you have to go spend time with him. Damn it, I thought. I went downstairs to my room, and I sat on the edge of my bed thinking about the upcoming night. I knew things weren't right. Whenever he was drunk and or high, he was a monster, and I didn't trust him, not even a tiny bit. You know, I think one of the tragedies, too, about divorce, you know, it's like, look, sometimes people have to get a divorce. It's just not going to work out, you know, and in this scenario, I mean, bravo to his mom for getting out of that. Um, But the tragedy is that when you marry somebody, when it doesn't work out, if you get a divorce, you can just, you know, set up boundaries and be like, I'm not going to go hang out with that guy. But when you're the kid, because you're blood related to this monster, you have to somehow not have boundaries. You have to go, even though every alarm bell is going off, you know, there's this understanding that, well, you spend time with me, now you go spend time with your dad. But they're not equal people. Spending time with his mom, and that's a safe thing to do. Spending time with his dad is not a safe thing to do. But because you're the kid, and because you're blood related to both these people, you don't get to cut one of them out. And, and you know... I'm not judging anybody in this scenario. I'm just saying it's tough when you're the kid of divorced parents because they can decide not to hang out with each other. And sometimes it's valid reasons why there had to be a divorce. And this is 100% a case like that. But when you're the kid, you don't get to just be like, I'm not going to go hang out with that guy. Anyway, he goes on to say that as I sat there not wanting to pack, I thought about a time when I was six years old. We lived in Thief River Falls still, not long before we moved to Duluth. Devin and I shared a bedroom, which was a normal thing for us, until we moved to a trailer park in 1998, when I got my own room, and Devin and Bo shared a room. The house before that, right outside of Morgan Park in Duluth, all three of us boys shared a room. It was tiny, so the trailer house was a nice upgrade. At our home in Thief River, to make our room seem a little bigger, Dad built us bunk beds. It was much cheaper than buying a bunk bed from the store, so a couple two-by-fours, a few sheets of plywood, and some screws, and Dave and I had our beds and a larger floor space to play. I had the top bunk. It was very sturdy and safe with a guardrail on the side in case I rolled too far to the edge. One night, Devin and I went to bed, and in the middle of the night, I rolled over into the railing. The railing prevented me from falling off the edge, but I was snapped awake by a stinging sensation on my back that jolted me awake. I immediately started bawling. Mom rushed in to see what was happening. When she turned on the light, we saw a screw sticking out of the railing, and I had rolled right into it. Instead of going back to sleep in my own bed, Mom let me lay in her and Dad's bed. Dad was out that night. I laid on Dad's side of the bed, my back still stinging, but eventually I fell asleep. 
I was jolted awake once more by the blinding glare of a bedroom light turning on. I looked up and I saw Dad sitting in the doorway. Oh, those drunks. They just, they, they love nothing more than to wake up people who are in their sound sleep. What's this? He said. Mom started explaining to him that I'd hurt myself on a screw that he'd forgotten to make sure wasn't poking out when he'd built the beds. As he started getting defensive with her, like it wasn't his fault, I felt underneath me on the bed. It was soaking wet. I'd pissed the bed when I'd fallen asleep, something Devin and I both did until we were about seven. Which, by the way, is a response. If children are still wetting the bed by age seven, that is a trauma response. That is anxiety. So, I mean, not surprisingly, I mean, quite frankly, I can't believe that they stopped wetting the bed at seven. But my heart is just breaking for these children. Even taking preventative measures like peeing before bed, not drinking anything a few hours before bed, it just happened. Something I thought I was at fault for, but in reality, something is out of control for a six-year-old. Dad was yelling at my mom, trying to defend himself about the screw when I uncovered myself and he saw the piss. He cut himself off mid-sentence to turn his attention to me. Are you effing serious? He said, looking at me. He walked around the bed to me, grabbed me by the Ninja Turtles pajama shirt, and raised me up off the bed toward the ceiling. I smelled the beer on his breath. I felt the fear course through me while he assessed the puddle on his side of the bed. Then he threw me up against the dresser, and I bashed against it, and I fell to the floor. Stop it! Mom cried. I have a vivid image from that night sitting at the base of the dresser, soaked in piss, sobbing, and reaching up for my mom as she screamed at Dad through her own tears. I can't describe a feeling worse than powerlessness walking around on eggshells, waiting for and trying to stay out of the way of the next snap. Then, when the snap comes, just sitting there and riding out the storm, no control, just praying for the least amount of damage possible. At six years old, there's not much you can do against a six-foot-two, 250-pound, pissed-off, drunk man. There's not much you can do when you're a 110-pound woman, either. And now, when I was 17, I still didn't feel safe around him, but I was starting to build my own muscle and athletic stature. As I sat on the bed thinking about this, I realized that the pit in my stomach was that powerless feeling. My body was hardening itself for the upcoming emotional battle, and although it wasn't all the time, I didn't put a physical battle past him. I reached under my bed and I pulled out Grandpa's gray metal box. In it, I still had Grandpa's wallet, which was now full of $2 bills that Grandma sent us on the holidays with her cards. There were medals for my sports, family pictures, and some money I'd saved up. I wasn't looking for any of that on that night. Instead, I grabbed the hunting knife that I kept in there, and I put it in my pocket. It's going to become very vital information. We go back now to his conversation with the investigator. And the investigator says, so you brought the knife with you because you knew something bad was going to happen, the investigator said. Yeah, I wasn't going to be defenseless at his apartment. Something was telling me to grab it and bring it with me. Something wasn't right. I could feel it. I knew it, I said. I've seen this cycle too many times now. I knew a snap was coming. I just knew that one day when he snapped, he was finally going to go too far. Obviously, I was right, and he did go too far. The officer nodded. Well, you don't need to explain yourself to me anymore. After what you've told me, I wouldn't have felt safe if I were you either. And you know what? I'm sorry. I wish we could have done something to stop this from happening. Well, I didn't know what to say to that. Was there even a way for them to stop something like that, I thought? He broke the silence. All right. Well, that's really everything. We stood up and he shook my hand, and as we were about to walk to the door, he remembered something. Oh, I'm sorry. One more thing. I know you got the knife from under your bed, but where exactly did you get the knife? Now we're going to find out where that knife came from. So he's going back in time to November 2001, so he would have been 11 at the time. He says, I sat on my bucket between two birch trees. I held an SKS rifle in my lap, snow on the ground, and I could see every breath as I peered out into the woods, waiting. Crack. The sound startled me and my heart began to pound. Crack. I raised my rifle as slow as I could trying to look around so that I wouldn't startle him with any quick movements. I still couldn't see him. My heart pounded faster. Crack. There he was right in front of me. A rabbit. I lowered my rifle. A wave of disappointment cleansed the adrenaline from my blood. It wasn't the 30-pound buck that I was looking for. At 11 years old, I'd been out hunting with my family almost every year. I loved walking through the woods in a line and trying to flush out the deer to the guys sitting on the road waiting to shoot them. Then after we shot a deer, the whole group would go back and clean the deer in the shop. I loved it. That was my first year carrying a gun after Devin and I got our gun safety certificates, and I was eager to shoot my first deer. 
We'd been sitting there for about an hour and a half, and I knew at some point we'd be leaving to meet up with the rest of the hunting party. I looked back toward Dad and Devin to see if they were headed my way yet. Crack! I whipped my head around, and he was standing right there about 30 yards away. A buck. My heart pounded harder than ever, and when I raised my rifle, I couldn't stop myself from shaking. I locked eyes with him, and he just stood there. I took a deep breath to try and stop myself from shaking and aimed where I knew I was supposed to. Bang. He took one jump and dropped about five feet from where he was standing. A perfect shot. I got him! He's down! I yelled to my dad and Devin. A few minutes later, we walked over and the three of us walked up to the deer. I was floating. I was so proud of myself. I just shot a five-point buck. I couldn't wait to show my friends and tell the rest of my family in the hunting party. And his dad's response would have meant everything. His dad says, nice job, buddy. I'm so proud of you. Putting my dad in a good mood and hearing him say stuff like that was always a great day. No snaps. And I felt like he truly was proud of me when he said it. It was a great feeling. Now we have to clean him. Ready to get your hands dirty? Dad pulled out a buck knife, and for the next 20 minutes, he taught me everything I needed to know to clean a deer. Killing something's a big deal. When you kill something, you have to make sure you don't waste any of the animal. This deer gave its life so that we can eat. Never take killing something lightly. Only when you're going to eat it or if your life or someone else's life is in danger. That's it. We got done cleaning the deer and before we started dragging it out of the woods, Dad wiped off, folded up, and handed me the hunting knife. This is yours. Make sure you hold on to it for later when we start processing the rest of them at the farm. And for the next deer you shoot next year. He gave me a hug. We began to drag the deer out of the woods. When we got home from Thief River Falls that weekend, I made sure to wash my new knife and I got it as clean as possible. And when I was done, I took out my grandpa's gray metal box from under my bed and I set the knife in it. Chills. Chilling. Chilling. Do you see what I am saying about the way he tells a story? I mean... This book is such a page turner. Okay, we are now on chapter six. We're going to go back to his time in the military. So right now it's December 2011. And he says, it was my first Christmas away from my brothers and my mom since 2007. And I was far away, as in halfway around the world away. After my medical training in San Antonio, I was assigned to my first base, Kadena Air Base in Okinawa. So there'd been this kind of like mix up actually when he had first found out where he was going because he was in Texas and they told him he was going to Kadena, but he mixed it up with the base Medina, which is in Texas. And so he called his mom and said, hey, I get to stay in Texas. And, you know, he was fine with being in Texas, but it would have been cool to see the world. Um, And but his mom was excited because, you know, it's not a long flight and they could still visit with each other. But then he was telling some of his friends, you know, yeah, I got to stay in Texas. You know, I got... Kadena and they're like, what are you talking about? That's Japan. So he ended up going to going to Japan and he was really excited about having this opportunity to travel. Um, he says, when I first arrived in Okinawa, it was Christmas time and on the base, everything was lit up and it felt almost as festive as in the States, except there wasn't any snow and having grown up in Minnesota, that felt weird. But um, Those first few weeks before Christmas, uh, he says, I settled into my new dorm room and I got a feel for the base and the new group of people around me. I had a great feeling about the next two years and I was excited about my new temporary home. But as you would expect, Christmas isn't exactly going to ever be the same again. Because Christmas is all all it's ever going to do is trigger you to the worst night of your life. He says, the first time it ever happened to me was that first Christmas Eve away from mom and my brothers in 2011. My new friends and I were at the dining facility eating breakfast on Christmas Eve morning. Just like most places on the base, in the chow hall, there was a big Christmas tree all lit up with fake presents underneath it and the ornaments were handmade from grade school kids in the States wishing the troops a Merry Christmas. As we were eating, I caught myself just staring at the tree. And I remember it happened like it was with the snap of a finger. Suddenly. I was back sitting on the couch in our old house on Christmas Eve of 2007. I could smell the chicken noodle soup mom made, still sitting in front of me at the end table, untouched because of the giant pit in my stomach. I could see our fake tree by the back door, all lit up and decorated with our family's ornaments. I could see the present I was opening on the ground in front of me, a white Nike sweatshirt with a black football on it. 
A black fuzzy blanket was draped over me, and a bottle of cologne had been opened, the smell mixing with the chicken noodle soup, and it created a real sour smell. I could see the headlights shining through the front window behind me, the pit in my stomach, boiling in a rush of adrenaline hitting my heart. I could hear the pounding on the door and the anger in my dad's voice and the chair shattering the window above the couch I was sitting on. Dude, my buddy said to me, and I snapped my attention away from the Christmas tree and out of my incredibly vivid vision. I could feel my heart rate pounding through my t-shirt. You good? One of them asked. All of them looked at me like I had a third eye coming out of my head. Um, yeah, man, sorry, I just daydream a lot, I said. I felt weird as hell and a little embarrassed in front of my new friends. Even after snapping back to reality, I could feel this rush of energy to my chest like I just needed to get the hell out of that place as soon as possible. I didn't know it at the time, but I was having a panic attack. I'm going to try and Skype my family, guys. I'll talk to you later. I got up from the table and left. On the way home to my dorm, I saw a police car with its lights on, and suddenly flashed back again. I was in the back of the cop car with Bo, watching them load my mom into the ambulance. I shook it off, and I focused on the road. When I got to my dorm room, I looked to see if I still had the bottle of cologne I got in 2007, and I did. The flashes started again. I sat in my room, and I replayed the entire sequence of events from the Christmas Eve over and over and over again. I felt the guilt and the anger and the fear. I felt it all like it was happening again, over and over, again and again. The beer in my fridge helped drown it a little bit, but not all. The next thing I knew, it was 3 a.m. Christmas morning. The whole day was a blur, and I hadn't left my dorm since the previous morning. I just ate the cereal I had in my room and finished all the beer that was in the fridge. I couldn't explain what the hell was happening. The best I surmised was that I was just feeling bad for myself. I just need to man up and get past it, I thought. See, the thing is, is that he wasn't willing at this point to label himself with having some sort of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, to him, that was that should have been left up for people who, in his mind, had really experienced things worth considering traumatic. And because he worked as a medic, he saw people who were like Vietnam vets, um, you know, people who had experienced unbelievable and significant amounts of trauma in his estimation. And those were the people with PTSD. And that what he needed to do was just get a grip and stop making, you know, and stop making a mountain out of a molehill. That was his internal dialogue. Not that it was true, but that's when, when you know, comparing himself, being like, well, my traumatic experience wasn't their traumatic experience. They have a right to have PTSD. I don't. I just have to find a way. There must be a weakness in me. That must be why it's ha I'm having such a hard time with this. But he writes that the only time I didn't have these panic attacks around Christmas time was when I was with my brothers and my mom. I knew they were the only ones who could understand because they had been there with me and knew the exact same feelings. Now, he shifts the conversation to talk about summer 2002 when he was 12 years old and a dream that he had, um, not a literal dream, but like a goal that he had in life. He and his brother and his friends had a, re had a goal that ended up being so significant that it drove him for the rest of his life and even to this day. He introduces us to this dream um, in this chapter. He says, that in the summer of 2002, he and his brother, Devin, and their friends, Dylan and Chase, were obsessed with making money. He said, that year we were counting our bags of cans that we'd collected to raise money for our, quote, dream room. The dream room was a term we used for the ultimate fort that we were going to build, filled with our favorite things, a giant TV to play video games on, guitars, a drum set, sports memorabilia, bubble hockey, a mini fridge, and a little studio for editing all the movies we were going to make. Most importantly, it'd be a place of our own to hang out away from our parents. We had big dreams with our movie ideas and businesses. One day, we were going to make millions and reach millions of people doing it. We just knew it. And it wasn't even really about the money. The money was a means to allow us to do what we wanted to do. With all of our ideas and dreams, we had to be efficient with our time. Because Chase and Dylan split their time with their divorced parents. Their dad lived just about a mile from us but their mom was more than half an hour away. We knew Chase and Dylan for as long as we could remember because our dads were friends growing up in the 70s and 80s. We were always planning our next business venture or writing our next movie plot. There was always a dream being chased. Always. And you know, what I think too is, 
there's almost nothing better in life than dreaming and, and wishing and trying to get to the goal. Once you get to it, there's something, it's always a little stale, but there's never anything stale about the dreaming part of it. He says, the four of us made a good team and we all contributed in different ways. As the oldest, I was designated leader and I try to push our ideas to become reality. Whether it was collecting cans to raise money or building a raft to go fishing on, I made sure we had our vision in focus, tried to keep the crew motivated and devised plans for us to make the dreams happen. I was also the group worry ward always thinking of the worst case scenario and planning ahead to try and avoid any problems, specifically trying to avoid getting in trouble with our dad. Dylan's place in the group was that he was all in and nothing was stopping him. And he's like that to this very day. Chase was four years younger than me. And even at eight years old, he brought creativity in our movies and he could play instruments, which was vital for our future band, Vanilla Twist. And he had the same dreamer mentality as us. Devin rounded out our group as the perfect counterbalance to my worry wardedness. Out of everyone, Devin was the most fearless. If we needed someone to do something dangerous, Deve didn't bat an eye. He'd grab the skateboard and hit the ramp, jump off the roof in the snowbank, flash his middle finger at authority if he had to. On the official record of our home movies, there are a number of documented Devin injuries. During our skateboarding phase, Deve hit a ramp we made and credit carded the skateboard when he came down. Credit card means the board hits you between the legs and it hits him square in the family jewels. In another video, we tried to make our own jackass type movie. The reason they were so obsessed with the jackass movies and Bam Margera's crew was um, not so much that they were really into what those guys did, but the fact that they had made a life doing things together. Um, He says that they skateboarded, they made movies, they made skits, they hung out as buddies, and they had somehow managed to find... uh, a way to do that in life and to make money. And that type of freedom was a freedom to us. And that's what we wanted to control our own destinies. The movie we made wasn't anything like the real Jackass movie, but the opening scene is of Devin going down the stairs in a laundry basket and blasting through the sheetrock at the bottom of the stairs. Hilariously, we set a backpack in front of that hole in the wall and nobody noticed until Chase and Dylan's dad sold the house three years later. So in some sense, we had some unsupervised freedom already. Now, in this next story, it's not really funny, but I have to say I laughed pretty hard. I'm sorry, Dave, but it is pretty funny. In one of the last skits of the movie, I was throwing a football up to Devin, and when he jumped to catch it, our friend Carl was supposed to hit him midair and tackle him. On the third try, the video shows Devin's legs getting taken out from under him, and he gets flipped onto his head where we hear a loud snap. We thought for sure he'd broken his neck. And for the final three days of filming our haggard movie, Devin is laying in the same position on Chase and Dylan's couch. He probably should have gone to the hospital, but we didn't want to get in trouble. So we let him lay there while we finished filming. (laughs) What? What? Why Why did they let Dave lay there for three days? (laughs) I mean, I guess it was like the, the the fear of getting in trouble was greater than the possibility that he broke his neck. But oh my gosh. Anyway, he says in our dream world, the four of us were going to make enough money to build a giant empire and enjoy the things we love to do. Ideally, our business would revolve around making movies. We were obsessed. This was the dream room. It was our escape. So he says that like, it wasn't the first time they'd built an awesome fort. When they were younger, they'd built a four-story fort in the woods, and it was pretty rickety, but also pretty awesome work for four kids. But he says that we knew we would need to step up our game and build something professionally, something that could handle all our big dreams. We didn't dare ask our parents for money to build our dream room, because we already knew what the answer would be. Our mom and dad would say, figure it out. If you want it bad enough, you'll work for it. And you know, here's the thing. It's not like anyone's going to get a handout in this economic bracket. You know what I mean? It's like their parents are already maxed out. They don't have any extra money so that you can go put a TV in the woods in your fort. Chase and Dylan's dad, Doug, would say something similar. Well, go get cans. Back in northeastern Brainerd, when we were eating ketchup sandwiches, we had to go collect cans just to eat. You'll figure it out. Northeast Brainerd was the poor part of town where our dads both grew up, close to where our old trailer park was. They were always telling us how bad they had it and that we had to appreciate everything we had. Part of the reason we worked hard for the things we wanted to do was because we knew for sure that our parents weren't going to just give it to us. So we never asked and we tried to figure it out for ourselves. 
And really, truly, I mean, the joy really is in the journey when it comes to things like this, because it's, it's like I've already said, having the ability to just have something instantaneously would have really robbed them from all of the years that they had so much fun planning it and saving for it and making it happen. He said he had some money saved up already from a paper route that he did back in the trailer park. At 12 years old, besides a trailer park paper route that paid less than $100 a month, there wasn't much else for employment. So we took Doug's advice and we collected cans, attending all of the adult football parties solely for the cans. And in a super endearing moment of innocence, he said they were caught sometimes taking the cans of beer and pouring out the can, pouring out the beer so they could have the cans. And he's like, we weren't bad enough to realize that if we really wanted to make some money, we could have stolen that beer and sold it to some of the high school kids at school. But they're just so innocent. Like, they're, like, legitimately trying to collect cans here. Aww. (laughs) Um, He says, we had our mind set on the dream room and nothing was going to stop us. The thing is, it was kind of, though, not, I mean, it went deeper than just, like, a cool place to hang out. It's like they needed a place to be safe in, where being kids and wasn't going to cost them constantly, Um, where there wasn't always somebody who was going to enter into the picture and then just be belligerent for no discernible reason. He goes on to say that one evening we were all out at our house and we were counting our money from the can collecting. They needed $500 to $600 for the giant TV alone. And they also needed money for lumber to finish off the structure. They had made some pretty impressive strides. They'd built a basement for storage and they had cemented the walls of the basement But of course, they were going to need more money because they actually have to build the structure above the basement. He says, I had all the faith in the world that we would succeed. I knew we were going to succeed and we would live out our dreams. But on this particular evening, after they had counted all their money and Devin had gone off to his room with his friends, he had three friends over and Desmond was going to bed in his room. um, he, He heard his parents fighting. And immediately he was on edge. He wasn't sure exactly what was going to come of this. If his dad was angry, it could be bad that night, but it could also bleed into the next day. And so now what, what, what were they all going to have to face because his dad was mad this time? He heard down the hall, Devin and Devin's friends cutting up, like they're making fart noises and stuff like that. And Desmond knew instinctively, if I don't get them to stop, this is going to make dad really angry. He's just, it's going to piss him off that they're making all this noise. So they need to quiet down. So he goes down the hall and he says, hey, you guys, I think dad's mad. I think we need to just kind of tone it down. Maybe just don't, maybe like quit all of this. Just be quiet. He goes on to say, Dylan and Chase knew enough to know my dad had a tendency to snap. And when he did, you didn't want to be around. But Devin's two other friends had no idea. And I shouldn't have expected them to understand, but I thought everyone's dad was like mine. Because you'll, you'll remember, he's only 12 at this point. He he hasn't quite connected the dots like he does later when he's 14 to, no, actually, everybody's dad's not like this. But he thought those other kids would realize, um, if you think your dad's mad, you just get in line because you're not. it's not time to poke the beast. He says, he, I walked back to my room. I laid on my bed. I was getting, it was getting late. It was around 11 p.m. And I just knew that the later it went and the louder the arguing got, the worse the reaction was going to be. Dave's friends did not heed the warning that they were given, and they just kept laughing and being loud. There's just nothing like laughter and noise that baits a hair trigger temper. Dad is going to be mad. I could feel it. A bunch of 11-year-olds laughing at farts and being stupid. How dare they? Sure enough, thump, thump, thump. His footsteps up the stairs to Devin's room shook the house. He got to Devin's room, and the boys in the room were silent. Turn on the fucking light, Dad slurred. There was nothing. Now! He screamed at the top of his lungs. You think that's funny, huh? I could hear only what was going on, but later find out from Devin that Dad had grabbed Devin by the shirt collar and dragged him out of the bedroom, down the stairs to the basement where Mom was. And if that wasn't humiliating enough to be treated like that in front of your friends, he could. uh, Desmond says he could hear his mom screaming, put him down, Mom pleaded. I'm calling the cops right now. There was silence for about a minute. I ran over to the metal box in my closet, grabbed my hunting knife. I laid back down in my bed and I clenched my eyes shut, praying to God to make him stop whatever was happening. And I held on to my knife. Thump, thump, thump. I heard Devin's footsteps scurrying back to his room and I heard him shut the door and I just heard the 
noises of whispers from him and his friends, but that's about it. I heard nothing else from downstairs, and after about an hour, I let myself shut my eyes and go to sleep. Well, the next day, his dad has to go to work, but he goes and he asks Steve, so what happened? You know, what was the deal with that? And apparently, he dragged Devin down the stairs, grabbed, you know, he's got him by the shirt collar, and he's raising a toy above Devin's head like he's going to bash him with the toy in front of their mom. She's screaming. She's panicking. That's why she said she was going to call the police. I felt relieved that dad wasn't home for the day, but we had to face him that evening and I dreaded it. Was he still going to be pissed off? Was he actually going to hit Devin or someone else next time? But all he knew from that incident was he and his friends better get that dream room sorted. Because if they had had a place to go, then they could have been as silly as they wanted to be. They could have cut up and nobody would have known, nobody would have said boo to them, you know? But they've got to get away from where this person's hair trigger can constantly be set off on them and where they have to constantly live in fear that something that they're going to do, some innocent thing they're going to do is just going to piss the dad off. Now, at this point, he switches back to talking about his time in Japan. When he had thought he was going to be in Texas, there was every assumption that he'd be able to see his family. But going all the way to Japan, no one's got money to fly to Japan, you know, so it was going to be a long two years before he saw his family again. But then something came up where he was able to go back home. So he says that he was assigned to a flight medicine clinic. Flight medicine was responsible for taking care of anyone who flew in a plane from pilots to the flight crew. And anyone who flew for their Air Force duties required extra medical attention on their physicals. The clinic was also responsible for any flight mishap investigations. If an aircraft crashes, an investigation needs to be conducted to see exactly why it crashed. And flight medicine is a very large part of conducting that investigation. The part that was tricky for me was that working in flight medicine required extra training, specifically on the crash investigation process. That training was in Ohio, and after just two months at my new duty station, I would be flying back to the States on the government's dime. When I was done, I'd be able to take some more leave, and I could visit home, and that's exactly what I did. Well, he was really excited to go back because he wanted to see his friends, but he really wanted to see Dave. He wanted to find out if Dave was having some of the same issues coping with what had happened that he was. Because obviously he wasn't going to talk about what he was experiencing with a bunch of like strangers who were just sort of acquaintance friends. Um, but he needed to know if the PTSD that he was struggling with was also something that was happening for, for Dave. He says, I flew home and I took a week of leave. I was excited to hang out with my friends again, but Devin was supposed to be home. It'd be the first time I saw him in at least a year. A few months before I joined the Air Force, Devin moved to Colorado to work, so I was excited to catch up with him and see how he was doing. I hadn't told anyone about my Christmas time flashbacks or panic attacks, but I was hoping to hear if maybe Dave was experiencing the same things. I was scared as hell to tell anyone about it, but if anyone could understand it, it would be my brother. But then this devastating thing happens. He says, when I arrived home, I realized I wouldn't be doing much talking with Devin about anything. When I walked into my mom's, Devin was there with his new girlfriend, Emma. My excitement to see him and meet her faded when I dropped my bags and walked into the kitchen. Before she reached out to shake my hand, I could tell that she was obliterated. And it was obvious that it wasn't just alcohol. I guessed she was high on some sort of pills because I'd seen this too many times before. I didn't know exactly what else they were high on but it wasn't my normal brother, Devin, who I was talking to. He says he spent 17 years cultivating a sixth sense. He knew exactly when somebody was on something and what. He says we were at mom's together for about five minutes before one of Devin's friends picked them up and they left to go to a party. And I was home for a week before I flew to Japan and I didn't see Devin or his girlfriend again the entire time. And I wouldn't see Dave again for almost two years. Now, we're not going to get into it tonight, but he is going to write one of my favorite chapters later on. It'll be in part three, where he says what Dave was doing the entire time that he was in Japan. It is by far one of my favorite chapters, um, just because of the way he writes about what was going on. And it's, it's a really well done chapter. So anyway, stay tuned for that part three. All right, now though, we are transitioning to chapter seven. We're going to go back to the time of the incident. So it's January now, it's January, 2008. Um, I'm gonna tell you guys right now, get out the tissues. This one is really emotional. This chapter is extremely emotional. He's gotta go back to school, right? Um, he can't prolong it. 
My brothers, mom and I, were still staying with our aunt and uncle at their trailer house south of town. It was nice being there because they didn't have neighbors. Quiet, calm, and isolated. The last thing my brothers and I wanted to do was go back to school. I had talked to my best friends once I got my phone back a few days before, and I told them a little bit about what had happened, but as far as I knew, nobody else could have known about it unless my friends told them. So I convinced myself that it wouldn't be that bad at school since only a few people knew about it. Until I saw the paper the next morning. Baxter man arrested of attempted murder, read the headline of the Brainerd Daily Dispatch. My heart sank. Now every kid in my class of 500 students in high school of 2,000 students would know. And aside from the newspaper article, I didn't realize at the time, because I didn't even know it existed, but a favorite pastime of people who live in smaller towns is checking in with the custody report of the county jails online, especially on Monday mornings or mornings after a holiday and a long weekend. Everybody knew. And, you know, I have to say that I continue to love his mom more and more with every chapter that I read. I just think she's the best. And she tells them this in a shining moment of motherhood. She says, you don't have to go, mom said. But I think showing up to school shows strength. And it shows that no matter what he does, he can't hurt you anymore. I think it's a good example to set. I just love her. I just love her so much. Because, I mean, she was just so, I mean, she was up against it. What was she going to do in this scenario? How was she going to mother these boys and have them respect their dad? She wasn't like in it to make them hate him. She was constantly trying to create a relationship with them. And it was it was her consistency in trying to create something for them that led to this entire thing happening. But it wasn't her fault. She was trying to do her best. In the, in the last part where we read, when she was about to get married, to their dad. She wasn't exactly like dancing with joy about it, but she felt like the right thing to do was to marry him so her boys could be raised in a two-parent home, or at least Desmond could. Dee wasn't born yet, but she wanted a two-parent home for her son. And even if that meant that she was going to have to put up with some things from this unpleasant person who'd been probably waving red flags in her face since day one, she constantly put herself secondary to what she thought was the best thing for the boys. And I just respect her so much. She just seems like she has so much wisdom. And I feel like this is like such a good statement. If they had not gone to school, it would have been understandable. But at the same time, going to school showed that he cannot control what we do. You know, he can, and it, it released them from being the victims of what he had done to them. They just go face the world. It wasn't their fault that the dad was completely out of control. They had nothing to do with it, you know? And there's, they, he cannot mark them any longer with what he's done. You can face the world head up, shoulders back, because you're innocent in all of this. Mom is right, I thought. I need to be an example for my brothers. If I stayed home, they'd probably do the same. Still, the idea of going to school sucked. Screw it. Man the hell up, Des, I said to myself, trying to build some sort of layer of defense in my head before I went to school. Hell, I drove around with whiskey plates for an entire year and my own football teammates talked about it in front of my face. Who knows what everyone said behind my back. That gossip didn't faze me then, so why should it faze me now? I just had to block it out and not care what people thought. But what he, the, the, the defense he really made for himself wasn't so much don't care what anybody else thinks, but just put your head down and get through the next year and a half. You know, it's got, it's got to be over soon. You can do it. You know, just go in, put in your time, get out. He says, I didn't care about any of the good things like being a football and baseball captain my senior year. I didn't care about prom. I didn't care about grades. Just the end of it. Once I was gone, I didn't have to worry about what people said anymore. To further mentally prepare myself, I decided to get to school early that first morning back and lift weights. I figured that maybe doing something physical would wear me out a bit and the exhaustion would deter any worry that might arise when I saw my friends. You know, kill the anxiety before it kills you. But when it got to the weight room, it wasn't empty. There was a coach there and there was another senior. They were lifting weights. Um, But they didn't seem to know anything about what had happened. They either hadn't seen the paper or they hadn't heard the news. And they just asked him like really genuinely, so how was your break? Did you go anywhere? Did you travel? Did you stay around here? You know, all the questions you ask people when you finally get back to school. So he thought, well, maybe people don't know, you know, awesome. So he goes to lift weights. He like, you know, racks the weights, he does a set, 
And then as he's sitting there, he just kind of zones out again. Like he just keeps replaying what, what just happened. And he says, I'd been talking to God a lot the previous few days. I thanked him many times for keeping my brothers and mom alive. And I prayed for him to give us strength going forward, especially strength on the first day back. As I sat there between sets, I found myself asking him, why? Why did this have to happen? So he travels back again to that night, December 24th, 2007. He says, after I put the hunting knife in my pocket, I closed grandpa's box and I put it under my bed. I packed a few pair of clothes for the weekend at my dad's. I walked upstairs where my mom and my brothers were already waiting to go. Mom, where are you going while we're at dad's? I asked. I'm, hoping, I'm heading over to Jess and Luke's then, and then I'm going to come home later, she said. Well, what if we don't want to stay at dad's? I said. Things will be fine, Desmond. He's been texting me weird stuff all afternoon. Something isn't right. You guys need to get over there. We're already an hour late. I mean, it's such an impossible line for her to walk. Here she has to try to nurture a relationship with her boys and their dad when she knows full well that guy's crazy. You know, that's why she's not with him anymore. But she has to continue to push them back towards the, towards him because he is their dad. And I just don't know how you would do that. I don't know how, I, I, I mean, talk about being between a rock and a hard place. We got into my car and I drove down the road to dad's apartment. He's being weird, man. I think he's drinking, I said to Devin on our way. We parked, grabbed our bags and the few gifts for our dad and we walked through the snowy parking lot. As soon as I slid the door open and walked inside, my body tightened. I hadn't even seen him yet and I knew for certain he was drinking again. I didn't see any bottles, but I knew the signs well enough to know. Rock music was blaring, there was smoke in the kitchen and two trays full of tater tots sitting on the stovetop. One thing my dad did when he got too messed up was cook an abnormal amount of junk food, and it often got burnt because he'd be standing in the kitchen on the verge of passing out, while he was supposed to be taking what he was cooking out of the oven. It ended the same way every time. And in fact, he gives an example, too, of one time his dad almost set the house on fire because he put a bag of popcorn in the microwave and then left it in there for like an infinity and almost burnt the house down. And he woke up the next day and the whole house smelled like burnt popcorn and his mom told him. You know, your dad almost burnt the house down trying to get popcorn. And his dad laughed and laughed like it was the funniest thing. Like, isn't that really funny that he did that? And you kind of are like, did he really think it was funny or is he just trying to make everybody else get off his back? Well, Desmond says, I didn't think it was funny then and I didn't think it was funny the night at his apartment. There you guys are. Your mom leave already? He popped around the corner as we walked in, slurring like a stroke victim, sarcasm with spite in his tone. No, dad, I drove my car over. It's just us, I said. Ah, oh, too bad. I made a lot of food. He walked into the smoky kitchen and took a tray of burnt pizza rolls from the oven, setting the tray next to the burnt tater tots. I walked in and assessed the situation further. I was looking for any signs of him drinking, specifically any bottles of booze. I already knew he was drunk, but I needed the hard proof to validate my suspicions. My brothers were in the living room putting the presents under the tree. Dad was playing air guitar in the kitchen to the rock music. And then his dad does something that he never does. He starts going after Bo. Now, he went after Desmond and Devin countless times. Countless times. But Bo, for whatever reason, was protected in a way the other two weren't. But not this night. So his dad's over there playing air guitar, just kind of acting goofy. And he says to Bo, Bo, you have this one on your little game? That game you're so focused on when you come over here and just play the whole time? My dad said. There was more spite in his tone. And this time it was directed at Bo, which was something that was unusual and caused me even more alarm. I didn't ever remember him directing his ire at Bo. I tried my best to act like we didn't know he was being weird. So then he tries to stick up for his brother and kind of smooth the situation out. He goes, well, have you seen him though, Dad? I mean, I think he could actually win tournaments. Bo mops the floor with all of us when he plays that game. They're talking about Guitar Hero, and apparently Bo was, you know, genuinely amazing at it. Dad ignored me and continued his air guitar. He's being extra weird, I thought. And the tragedy here, as he's already mentioned, is that just two months ago, his dad had gotten out of rehab. And he writes, he had to know that we knew he was drinking again right after getting out of rehab. It's like he didn't even care one bit that we might have known, which was another reason for me to be on alert. After all the crying just a few months ago of him saying that he was going to change, it's like he was saying, screw it and screw all of you too. I got to piss, I said, and I walked to the bathroom and locked the door. I took out my phone and texted my mom. Mom, he's messed up. We're not staying here. He's being really weird. I looked around the bathroom. And there they were. 
The empty bottles of beer in the trash can along with empty prescription pill bottles. I didn't bother to look at what the prescriptions were, and I had no clue if he had taken any of them with his beer. All I knew was there were several empty pill bottles in the trash can with the empty beer bottles. And it's just so painful. Can you imagine if you had pinned your hopes on the idea that your dad was going to be a different person and that he's coming off that high right off at the end of football season when he and his team had played so well. He specifically had played well and his dad had called him out for it and had been so proud of him. It was like, I love you, son. And it's like, oh, I'm not, like I'm getting a new, a new dad. You know, his dad had missed all the season, but he was there at the end when he had all that, you know, the winning touchdown and, you know, multiple amazing plays. And now, two months later, his dad is exactly, if not worse than he was when he went into rehab. I mean, the disappointment would be so extreme. He says, I shook my head. I'd already known it, but seeing the empty bottles there killed me. Dad told me he was going to rehab for my brothers and me, to be a good dad, and he'd lied. The hard proof was right before me. Before he had left for Hazelden, he'd hugged me on the top step of our house. He told me he loved me. And for whatever reason, he'd also said, You're better than this town, Desmond. When you can, leave it. You have a big future ahead of you. I'd hugged my dad and cried with him. I wanted him to get better. And I was relieved that he wanted to, too. I was sad to see my dad in so much pain, even if I had bad memories of him when he was drunk. But I was proud as hell of him for wanting to change. He was my dad, and I loved him. Now, standing in his bathroom, all that seemed like a big lie. We're leaving as soon as we get a chance. Something doesn't feel safe. I texted my mom again. Okay, call me as soon as you leave. Mom texted back almost immediately. She knew I was making the right call. I knew we couldn't just get up and go out or he'd flip out. We'd have to sneak out. So he goes, he leaves the bathroom, goes to the living room where his brothers are. When he walks into the room, his dad walks out of the kitchen, presumably to get another drink. And he tells his brothers, we're not staying here. Grab your coats, grab your shoes. We need to sneak out. So you need to be prepared on my signal. His dad comes wandering back in with this interesting statement. He's like, you know what you guys should do? You should take candy canes and put them on the doors of the other apartments in the hall. There's a lot of little kids who'd love it, he slurred. And this is just a lot of weirdness because you know what this is? This is an effort from their high and drunk father to appear sober by being real falsely cheerful, you know, but you can always tell when they're acting like this because they just, it's like this heightened chipperness. Well, you guys should go, you know, think about the little kids, you know, Mm -mm. but it does give them the perfect opportunity to get out and stay out and go home. So he says, you know, here's our chance to sneak out. And he's like, yeah, we'll we'll go put some candy canes out on some doors. He felt his phone buzz. His mom's trying to check up on them. Have you left yet? Are you leaving yet? Are you guys okay? So he nods to his brothers and he motions towards the sliding door like, let's get out of here. And he says they didn't run. They just walked. They got in the car and then they sped off down the road. I called my mom. Mommy's messed up. There were empty beer bottles and pill bottles in the bathroom. Something is wrong with him. He seems pretty pissed too, I said. Okay, I'll see you back at the house. She began, Mom, no. We can't go back to the house. I'm telling you, he's going to do something. I know it. We can't go home. Where are you guys? I'm pulling into the Best Buy parking lot right now. Come meet us. The Best Buy was half a mile from Dad's apartment and we sat there for two minutes before Mom pulled up next to us. My phone vibrated. Dad was calling. I let it go to voicemail. I opened it and I let the message play on speaker so mom could hear from the other car with our windows rolled down. Where do you go, Desmond? One minute you're here and then poof, you and your brothers are gone. His slurring was even worse. We can't go home, mom, I said. Well, what are we supposed to do? It's Christmas Eve, mom said. I don't know. Well, why don't we drive back to Thief River Falls? We could go to Dan and Lacoe's. We could get a hotel. We just can't go home. Dan and Laco were our friends from down the street. They were like family, and they knew better than anyone the issues my family had. They had seen firsthand for years. Dan helped coach our baseball teams and was my dad's best friend. They were some of the best people I knew, and I knew that they would understand if we went to their house, even if it was Christmas Eve. I just knew we couldn't go home that night, anywhere but home. 
None of us were going to stop him if he tried to do something. He was a huge guy. Well, this is the problem, though, because his mom doesn't want to go and presume on friendship. You know, even if they are good friends, she feels awkward about it. And she says, we can't go to Dan and Lico's. They have their own Christmas stuff going on with the boys. He's not going to do anything if we go home. And I absolutely am not putting anything on their mom. I mean, she is like amazing. I, I just love her so much. But there's definitely, but there's definitely a, a whole lot of denial that you have to put yourself in or that you tend, you can put yourself in if you happen to be in a situation like this. Because if you decide to live with the reality of how terrible this person is, that you are married to somebody who would even consider hurting you or your kids, how can you bear that reality? So it's much easier to just say, let's just go home. It's nothing's going to happen, you know? And Desmond, it would appear, is the sort of person who is always concerned about what bad thing could happen and is always planning for the worst. Not in like an Eeyore kind of way, but just in like, I need to lead with a plan. And his mom in this scenario, I think just, to, I mean, who wants to think that the person you are married to, even if you're divorced from them, would ever raise a hand to really hurt you? And of course, anybody from the outside would look at the many, many times that he has physically roughed up her, the kids, and said, uh, he, it's possible that he could go that way. But if you're in that situation, I can imagine that it would be incredibly easy to minimize it and think, well, you know, he was just kind of upset, but he wouldn't actually really hurt anybody. So that's kind of her headspace. It's like, okay, I know he's pissed off, but he's over there. He's not going to come. He's not going to bug us and really believe that he wouldn't bother you. So she says he's not going to do anything, but Desmond insists. He's like, mom, yes, he is. I am telling you, I've been talking to him all day and something in him snapped. It's like he doesn't even care anymore. Desmond, we have to go home. She said, come on, we'll figure it out when we get home. She started driving away and I followed her. This is not a good idea, I thought. And his forethought is wild. When they get back to the house, he's got a plan. Oh, this is a man with a plan and he does not intend to get trapped in that house with his mom and his brothers. So he says, we parked and we went inside. The first thing I did was take my shoes off at the front door and I carried them downstairs to my bedroom. A few years before, Devin and I both moved our rooms downstairs. My bedroom had a large egress window in it and I pulled the screen off of it. I set the screen behind my dresser. I set my shoes right under the window to make sure that the window was unlocked by cranking it all the way open before shutting it again. We need another way to escape if we have to, I thought. If he was as drunk as I suspected he was, all we had to do was get out of that house. He wasn't going to chase us very far in that condition. I had to prepare us all for the worst case scenario. Mom hadn't seen the severity of it. And if I was wrong, then good. I hoped I was, but I knew I wasn't. Man, my heart is aching at the maturity that he had to have to lead them in this situation. To, to bear that weight and to know that your mom isn't trying to put you in a bad situation. She just didn't see it the way you saw it. And it's just really easy to be like, you know, I mean, I'm sure she's still living in the hope that he's still sober and that maybe he's just in a bad mood or something. But surely he hasn't gone straight back to the, to the drugs and the alcohol. I walked upstairs to where my brothers were sitting in the living room. Poor young Bo, he's looking for any kind of distraction. So he's kind of sorting out the Christmas presents that they weren't going to get until after they'd spend time with their dad. But Desmond's like, I don't want to open any presents. I mean, that's the farthest thing from my mind. I need to get through this night and make sure that nobody in my family is hurt. So in effort to keep the night light, um, they decide, you know, they're going to eat dinner. They're going to open the gifts and they're just going to kind of try to pretend like there isn't something looming over them. He says, my mom was in the kitchen heating up some chicken noodle soup. When she brought it to us, the pit in my stomach was so hard. I could barely even sniff the soup without gagging. I was not hungry in the least. I wouldn't have been able to take a sip of water if I wanted to. Then his phone started vibrating. It was his dad again, but this time he, there was no voicemail. Oh, well, open your presents. Mom said, we opened our gifts. I opened up a box that contained a white sweatshirt with a black Nike football on it and a bottle of cologne. I sprayed it on my hand to smell it and I thought it smelled great, just not with chicken noodle soup aroma mixing with it. I set the shirt and cologne back in the box and wrapped myself up with a black fuzzy blanket which was a gift from my mom a few Christmases before. I went to grab the second gift to open when from the window behind where I was sitting I saw headlights glare on the living room. 
They got brighter and brighter as I came closer and parked right outside the window. I heard the door slam, the footsteps up the wooden stairs to our front door. Dump, 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 and then pound, pound, pound of his fist before I heard, Open the fucking door! Now! Crash! The sound of glass from the window above me shattering. And that's where he stops and we don't find out what happens next, but he goes back to the workout room where he'd been sitting. I sat on the workout bench, reliving the scene for the thousandth time in the week since it had happened. I looked up at the clock and realized I'd been sitting there for the last 15 minutes. Luckily, nobody else in the room noticed. At least it didn't seem like it. Sitting there for 15 minutes and not lifting a single weight, just reliving my Christmas break. It wasn't like I was trying to relive it or sit and feel sorry for myself and my family. I just found myself dissecting the whole thing in partial denial that it had even happened because it all felt so surreal still and I was trying to figure out how I could have stopped it at all. The other part that I couldn't figure out was why. When I sat and thought of this stuff, the event would start replaying and once it started, it was hard to stop. Like a movie, it just kept going. I questioned whether or not I should be there at school that day. After all, maybe I should just leave. From the, from the other end of the weight room, I saw one of my football coaches, Coach Hawk. There wasn't one coach I had that I didn't respect and consider someone I trusted, but Coach Hawk was my favorite. He wasn't a hard ass by any means, but he knew how to let me know when I wasn't playing to my potential. I had him as a coach when I was a sophomore, and one of the first two-a-day practices that fall, we were doing our end-of-practice conditioning. That day we ran Warrior 200s, which were simply running from goal line to goal line, usually about five times. On the first run down and back, I finished near the front with the fastest seniors and juniors, definitely top 15 finishers of well over 100 players. Hawk walked up to me in front of the whole team and yelled, What are you doing, Janicek? You are one of the fastest guys out of anyone here. You should be in the front every single time. If you're cheating yourself, you are cheating your teammates. You are a leader here. Act like it. He's right, I thought. I can't take it easy. I need to be an example. On the next three 200s, I finished in first by 10 yards each time. I felt like my heart was about to explode, but by pushing myself that day, I knew how much more I could give and what was possible. It was just as much a mental game as it was a physical one. I had to put out more. I had to do the right thing and do my best for myself and for the team. And this translated onto the field. I was a quarterback and corner on defense of the sophomore team that year, and we didn't lose a game, 8-0. One game, we were losing in the middle of a blizzard against Alexandria. Hawk pulled me aside and said, we need you here. You can do this. On that drive, I ran in 80-yard touchdown, and we won by seven. Coach Hawk had the ability to bring out the best in me, and for that, I loved playing for him. I think it's easy to dismiss our teenage sporting experiences, but at least on the team I was a part of, I learned a lot of things that are applicable to my everyday life, and for that, I am eternally grateful. I was still sitting at my workout bench in the back, and Coach Hawk saw me sitting there. He started walking back toward me, and I wondered if he'd seen the newspaper or if he'd just asked me how my Christmas break was like my other coach and teammate. I stood up to shake hands, and instead he reached out his arms and hugged me. I can't tell you how happy I am to see you here today, he said, and all my worry about school that day faded. I was supposed to be there. I needed to be there. Ooh, getting a little teary-eyed. It's just so touching. I mean, there's a lot of times we try to find the right words to say for people who we know have been in a really traumatic situation. And sometimes all you have to do is just be there for the other person. Sometimes there's not anything to say. You just need you just need to know that you're supported. And um, anyway, that's the end of that section. Um, next time we're together, we're going to be doing, let me check real quick going to be doing eight, nine, and 10. So that'll be part three. Um, Thank you so much again for being with me during this review. I hope you are enjoying this book as much as I am. I think it's like I've said a million times, a phenomenal book and a wonderful read. And I think that he is a fantastic writer. So I'm so pleased that he chose to write a book and I think that he is extremely talented in doing it. And I hope he writes more books after this as well. All right, I'll see you guys tomorrow for part three. And then again, for part four on Friday. See you soon. Bye.